الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهده ونستغفره واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده والنبي ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم beginning the khutbah al juma praising god almighty walhamdulillah for having gathered us for having gathered us walhamdulillah with the mind that we would answer the call of allah leave wherever we were whatever we were doing to come to the remembrance of allah and to establish this prayer the juma prayer not only in mecca or in other parts of the world but to establish the juma the remembrance the prayer in the united states of america and to be able alhamdulillah to have the capacity to be able to follow in the way of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam today we ask allah's peace and blessings on the prophet alayhi salam on his family and companions all of the anbiya and those who follow the way of allah's haq this way that we call islam until the day of judgment amen this khutbah al juma is very special for me Today is the last Friday in the month of February and February is known in America as Black History Month. But really it's not Black History Month, it's just the history of America that's been blacked out from the history books. And in blacking out the history of black americans they also blacked out the history of islam in america and so alhamdulillah today i want to tell part of the untold story and i want to share with you something that i believe alhamdulillah should commit you to doing more to raise up the condition of those people who came before us saying la ilaha illallah muhammadan rasulullah people ask sometimes how did islam get to america well muslims came to america before the time of columbus there are records recording that from west africa African Muslims sailed across the Atlantic. One of the most famous, the brother of Mansa Musa who traveled and made a famous pilgrimage to Mecca from Timbuktu, that his brother Abu Bakr II traveled with over a thousand ships from West Africa to the Americas one century before Columbus. So if anyone asked the question, who was here first compared to Columbus and the Europeans, say we the Muslims, we were here first. That those who would say then, how did Columbus come to America? Well, it's important that we realize that it was Tariq Aziad who opened Spain for Islam. And that eight centuries later, eight centuries later, the Spanish would drive Muslims out of the Iberian Peninsula, the Moors, and thus would not be able to travel safely through North Africa and the Mediterranean 
but with the help of two descendants of Moors in Spain, they shared the maps that Muslims had developed on how to navigate the Great Lake, the ocean we call the Atlantic. And with that, this Italian Columbus was able to gain financial support. He traveled with three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. And two of those ships were captained by Muslims. So we came before Columbus and we came with Columbus. And because of the unfortunate circumstance Many of us were taken not as slaves, but as prisoners of war, sold into slavery, and brought to America. It is estimated that maybe one-third of Muslims, one-third of the enslaved Africans were Muslim. We're talking about the estimated arrival in the Americas as a conservative estimate, 30 to 40 million enslaved Africans. What that means is that if you take that number and you take one-third of 30 million, there were more Muslims in America as a result of the slave trade then, then there are Muslims in America today. So if we want to think about a genocide. But what I want to share with you today is something even more serious. You know, we don't, we don't talk about this much among ourselves, but we feel it a lot. And that is that shaitan is real. The devil, Iblis, is real. And that Iblis is not affected the way we are with our lifetimes. That Iblis has centuries of knowledge. And I find it uniquely significant that in turning people from being free to being slaves, not, not Abdullah, not an Abd for Allah, but someone who is enslaved by another human being, Ibn Ashur, may Allah have mercy on him, wrote about this concept in Maqasid of Sharia, of the five durura, the five necessities of human existence. Those five, maybe many of you, you know them, to preserve hifd al-hayat, to preserve your, your dignity, your humanity, your soul. Hifd al-aqal, to preserve your intellect. Hifd al-nasl, to preserve your lineage. Hifd al-mal, to preserve your wealth. And hifd al-deen, your religion, your way of life, your relationship with Allah. I believe that it's not by accident that the colonizers, maybe they, they colonized the country that you came from. They definitely colonized this country. But for some people, they took it one step further. They institutionalized slavery. And in American slavery, as if shaitan had taught them, the American institution of slavery required the removal of all of the five durura from the enslaved African. So they said, if you kill an enslaved African, whether he's Muslim or not, you don't go to jail. 
because they're not human. They don't have a soul. This is what they said. Now, I don't know if you can imagine. This is a, this is a period we're talking about at over 200 years. Generation after generation living in a society that says you are not human, you don't have a soul. The second, shaitan must have taught them. Hifd al-aql, make it illegal for the enslaved people to learn how to read or write. So you have people like Frederick Douglass who would ultimately become free who learns how to read on the streets of Baltimore from passers-by trying to pick up whatever he can to learn how to read because it's, he, it's, it's an act of civil disobedience. It's a crime for my ancestors in this country to learn how to read or write. Two, three. The enslaved African in America did not have control of their lineage. So if an enslaved person has a child, the child doesn't belong to the parent. The child belongs to the master. And so when the child gets old enough, then the master decides like a person who has, uh, their cat has kittens. Once the kittens get to a certain age, uh, then they just have a little sign, kittens for sale. And you sell the kitten to, off to whoever the neighbors are. This was the condition that they had for enslaved Africans. For Hifd al-Mal. They made it illegal for enslaved people to own property because they are property. So there's no inheritance. Can you imagine a people going from one generation to another generation for five, six, seven, eight, nine generations? The father cannot pass on anything to his wife or his children. And then they have the audacity to talk about the wealth gap between black Americans and whites. Because that the ability to transfer wealth is taken from us. Last but not least, they said it's illegal for the enslaved African to practice any religion. And they said, why does he need to practice religion? He doesn't have a soul. Brothers and sisters, I don't believe that these people could have known how to completely remove the humanity unless they had been taught what the necessities of human life are and then systematically remove them. What they exchange them with, now even if you send your children to school and you ask little Ahmed or Fatima, Fatima, what are the necessities of life? She says, oh, uh, food, clothing, shelter. So really, that's what animals need. For human life, you need these five durura to preserve, alhamdulillah, hifd al-hayat, to preserve your, your intellect, your legacy, your, 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 your knowledge. Hifd al-nasr, to preserve your lineage and your family, your mal, your wealth, that you, you work and you save and you pass on your wealth either to be sadaqa jariya or to go to your children or to your, your, your community and to preserve your deen. Brothers and sisters, I want you to, to take some time and think about the condition when you see African Americans and you see the condition and you see, you see the statistics 
I want to remind you that one out of every three of those people, their ancestors were Muslim. What happened to them? I believe, alhamdulillah, if we establish justice and equity in this nation, part of the job will be to restore those five to the descendants of the enslaved African. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam wa rasulihi kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihim ayin mabad You know, uh, many years ago when I was um, at Howard University, we had um, a, a brother in our MSA who he had um, He, he, he came from overseas. He didn't really n know uh, anybody, Bismillah, know anybody here, but he had heard the, the propaganda about black, about black Americans, you know? And so uh, in the propaganda then was reinforced because he, he rode on the city bus to school. And he could only afford to live in a, in a lower rent area as a student. So he, so he was living with the people who, who, in the low socioeconomic level. But when he got to university and he met the Muslims in the MSA, some of them were African Americans, he said to one of the other brothers from, I won't mention the country, from the, his home country, he said, why is it that the other blacks that I see on the bus and in the news, why do they act so differently than the blacks I meet on campus? He's, of course, he's in the MSA, right? And the brother told him something that he probably at first didn't really understand. Because where he's comes from, everybody's Muslim. Some of them are good, some of them are no good. Some of them drink, some of them don't drink. Some of them do, right? He's used to that. That's where he's from. So when the brother told him, he said, the reason that the blacks that you meet in our group are different from the ones that you see in the ghetto is because of Islam. That Islam began to restore in them the values that come from the Quran and the Sunnah. That it returned, start to return to them the, the, the honor of being, being Muslim. The, the honor of, 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 of intellect, of seeking knowledge. It returned to them because they accepted Islam, returned to them a sense of their lineage. To be a father, to take care of your children. To, to be conservative with your wealth, spend it in Allah's cause. To see them, they've been transformed because have the deen, they have preserved the deen of Islam in them. And I'll tell you the, the funny thing about this brother. Since this is a comment, his name was Murad. Murad said, wow, I never knew Islam could do that. <laughs> but it made him a better Muslim. It made him a better Muslim coming to America. Many people are asking the question, since I left Dar Hijra, what am I doing? First, I want to, to share with you that I love Dar Hijra. The faces that I see here, I've served for 15 years. So some of you, you were small when I first saw you. 
and now they're men and women and parents and subhanallah some of the people that I met here they have been buried and we continue to make dua for them and Dar Hijra subhanallah is a great institution and it will be a great institution whoever's here because there's something about this place that Allah has blessed, that alhamdulillah, Allah inshallah will preserve it. You know, somebody they said, oh, Imam Johar, are you gone? And you know, all the work that we did. And so I said, look, on the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Umar ibn Khattab, he was overcome with grief. After my mother passed away, I, I started to understand what Umar was talking about. He said, whoever said that Muhammad is dead, I'll cut their head off. That's grief. That's loss. That's how you're supposed to feel. But Abu Bakr, in his calm demeanor, he's reported to have said, Know that whoever worshipped Muhammad, alayhi salam, that Muhammad is dead. But whoever worshipped Allah, know that Allah is alive and will never die. This deen, alhamdulillah, this house is Allah's house. This deen is Allah's deen. People will come and go. But alhamdulillah, your commitment and my commitment to Establishing to maintain Islam should be maintained. So this is not a person. It's not a cult of personality. But if people want to know what I plan to do, uh, recently we've seen some reports that the number of descendants of converts in Islam. It's going down. They're disappearing. Now I believe that they're still Muslim, but they're out there. And so we began looking, where are these convert families and their descendants in our area? Where do they live? They don't, by the way, most of them don't live in Fairfax. So we found out where most of them live. They live, uh, if anybody knows D.C., Abdul Karim was here earlier. They have eight wards in D.C. So they either live in wards seven and eight or Prince George's County, which is what we call Ward 9. And as Muslims are being, and blacks are being pushed out of D.C., I hosted last Eid, an Eid event because there was a brother who's from this community, he prays with us, but many years ago, he wrote an article in the Muslim Link. The title of the article was called Eid, the loneliest day of the year. You say, how could Eid be the loneliest day of the year? He wrote in his article that it's the loneliest day of the year for many who have embraced Islam, we get up in the morning, alhamdulillah, and put on our best clothes and take a nice shower and we put on our itar and we gather with our family and we come to the masjid. And after the prayer, everyone is shaking hands and, and, and congratulating them. And then without thinking about it, each of us goes back to our communities, our families. If you're Sudanese, there are some Sudanese people, they're having something, you go there. And the, some of the brothers from Gujarat, they're having something there. Someone from Lahore, the brothers are going there. The one in Senegalese is going here. The Somali is going over there. And the poor convert to Islam, where's he going to go? 
You don't know where he's going because you didn't ask him. So after everybody clears out and you see him just standing around, he's happy all by himself. So we hosted an Eid event in Prince George's County last Eid. 1,000 people showed up, not for the prayer, just for a picnic. 1,000 people. The overwhelming majority of them, converts and their descendants and their families. In that area, the Masajid had not organized anything for them. It's my hope to spend the next 15 years, I spent 15 years here, Bidnillah, to spend 15 years over there to help them build the capacity and to maintain and establish the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala among them. So if you don't see me, make dua for me, that's where I am. Not a whole lot of money over there. Uh, somebody warned me you won't be on television. I told him, that's all right, I've been on television enough. I don't need to be on television. I, I want to be recorded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we establish this deen. So please make dua for me. Uh, I wanna, want you to know, alhamdulillah, uh, even those of you who have a problem with me, I still love you. <laughs> because on, on Yom al Qiyamah, it's not going to matter. That we were all lovers of Allah, trying to follow the example of His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. اللهم أدينا في من هديت وفينا في من أفيت وتولنا في من توليت Oh Allah, guide us among those whom you have guided. Oh Allah, protect us among those whom you have protected. Ya Allah, take us, walhamdulillah, as a friend as you took Ibrahim alayhi salam as a friend. Ya Allah, we ask, walhamdulillah, that you preserve us, walhamdulillah, on the deen of Islam. Oh Allah, help, walhamdulillah, that our children, our descendants, Ya Allah, that they would maintain the durur of Islam. Walhamdulillah, to preserve their, their lineage and their wealth and their intellect. Walhamdulillah, their, their, their honor and dignity as a Muslim, Ya Allah. Walhamdulillah, that they would maintain the deen of Islam until the day that they meet Allah. Oh Allah, we ask for you to preserve this house, walhamdulillah, only for the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, we ask that you have mercy on us and our families. Ya Allah, have mercy on those who are suffering with difficulties, Ya Allah, around the corner or around the world. Oh Allah, we ask, walhamdulillah, that you might make us emissaries of your peace. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam wa tabarak ta yadal jalali wal ikram. Oh Allah, we ask that you bless us, walhamdulillah, with the best in this life. And the best in the hereafter. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasnatan wa fil akhirati hasnatan wa kina adhab in nar. Khinna jannata ma abrar. Ya aziz, ya ghafar, ya rabbal alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ar-rasulihi kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi jama'een. Mabad, akim salat.